so y you probably know here at the church we're, we're um, in this new sort of ident identity crisis mode where we're trying to figure out who we are as a church. Crisis in a good way. It's an it's a, it's a ch opportunity for change. And we've been doing this um, uh, program the way. And we started, we're actually in the second uh, phase of it. The first one was B3rd. And uh, for th those who haven't read this, uh, B3rd is about God is first, others are second, and guess who I am? Third. You know? So uh, don't just think about your own interests, uh, but be interested in others. And I, I love this line here. It was, it was very um, profound but simple. Don't think less of yourself. Don't think less of yourself. Just think of yourself less and others more. Now, get my glasses out so I can see. This week, the, um, the rule for this week is to speak the truth with love. And we are to speak honestly and directly in a way that clearly reflects love and support for one another. Be courageous enough to say when or to say what needs to be said even when it's difficult. Address issues di directly with those who are involved or affected. Speak to, but not about others. My name is Tom McBride. I am a member of the um, foundation that was started by Joyce um, in honor and memory of my dear friend and, and Joyce's husband, uh, Ken Peacock, the Ken Peacock Memorial Lecture Series. So if you're here for Ken Peacock Memorial Lecture Series. The good news is you're in the right room. Okay. Before we go any further, though, I'd like to invite our pastor, uh, Stuart Spencer, to um, handle the invocation in prayer. Friends, good evening. It's great to see all of you. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. Uh, some of you who may be friends of the church may not know me. And as Tom said, I'm, I'm Stuart Spencer, and it's been my uh, great joy and delight the pastor here. I'm, I'm in my seventh month, so I'm as brand new as can be. But I do know where the bathrooms are, so I, I can get you there um, and maybe a few other places. And um, it's really uh, uh, so uh, happy to see all of you here. And uh, we are excited uh, to welcome Dave and Esther Miller as our guests for tonight and tomorrow. And I was telling them over dinner that uh, there's so many things that are happening here that are the work of God. Um, what Tom was sharing with you is an attempt that we've been working on since I came to define our culture or to create an atmosphere thick with love, to borrow a phrase from Ephesians 4, verse 1 and 2. Um, and what we've, what we've come to believe is that culture can be, or atmosphere can be shaped and created if you identify the culture elements that you that you desire, and that's what Tom was sharing with you. And then what we're doing is just trying to keep us keep these concepts, which are all deeply biblically rooted, in front of us, week after week, month after month, year after year. And these will be reminders to us to just remind us what it's like, how what it means to be God's church here. So it's very exciting. But something else that's happening in addition to thinking about our culture is there is a deep desire and a kind of a growing interest in prayer. So to have um, an opportunity to go deep on the subject of prayer with a gifted uh, guide like Dave and Esther is a great gift to us. So thank you. Welcome, friends. Um, let's pray, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, be in for a wonderful evening. Let's pray together. Good and gracious God, Tonight we adore you and praise you because you are merciful and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and mercy. This gives us great joy and confidence as we come into your presence this evening. Lord, we come with our mouths wide open asking that you would fill the deep needs that we bring to you tonight. For we are hungry for the bread of life. We are thirsty for the one who has the, the waters that can quench our thirst alone. We are broken, and Lord, we need your 
touch of healing and mercy. Everyone is. So I ask that you would bless Dave and Esther tonight, their family, their work, their ministry, and our time together. And Lord, as you're shaping us as a congregation, do the same as the potter shapes the clay. All of your children here tonight. Thank you, Lord. We offer these prayers together, and we do so in agreement in your name and for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Stuart. Um, the book, A Praying Life, is available for anyone who has not picked up a copy yet. Um, coincidentally, I got a copy of this book from a friend two years ago, uh, my friend Ian McDonald, who's a member of the Episcopal Church in Westchester. And he came over to visit me one Saturday for breakfast. He said, oh, I have a little present for you. And what do you think it was? It was a praying life, which we're going to hear about tonight. A little background uh, about our speaker. A Praying Life um, is a book written by Paul Miller. Tonight's speaker is David Miller. Uh, we'll be looking into Jesus' teachings on prayer patterning um, tonight, tomorrow ourselves after Jesus, modeling the life of prayer that Jesus exemplified in very very easy, simple, easy to follow ways in the gospel. Um, we'll be talking about practical tools, becoming focused in, in our prayer life. Uh, David and his wife Esther live in Philadelphia. They have four children, three sons-in-law, and seven grandchildren. They have lived and worked in this area for much of the last 40 years. They spent four years mentoring and training church leaders in Chile before joining the staff of See Jesus as Latin American coordinator. David as, um, uh, is a church uh, planting pastor with the PCA. Uh, he originally visited Chile to do short-term construction projects, uh, but then he and Esther moved to facilitate discipleship, moved there to facil facilitate discipleship and help raise Jesus-centered leaders throughout Latin America. The same passion that led the Millers to move to Chile ultimately brought them back to Philly to partner with See Jesus, and we'll be hearing more about that tonight. Having taught uh, Person of Jesus seminars in Spanish and English throughout Latin America and the U.S., he is continually amazed by the engagement that grows out of what is called the inductive format, which I hope to hear a little bit about tonight. Let's give a warm welcome to Dave Miller. <laughs> Oh, pretty good. <laughs> wow. Uh, I didn't know I did all that stuff. Um, yeah, I am uh, with See Jesus just for about two years. I haven't been with them very long, but um, I've been around uh, Paul Miller and his family um, for a long time, since about 1992, we first kind of came into the same church circles that, that Paul Miller was growing up in under his dad, Jack Miller. Do any of you know Jack Miller? Is that a name that's known to you? Okay, he was a, God used Jack. He was a professor at Westminster Seminary, went through somewhat of a crisis, and ended up finding uh, the gospel and was able to articulate that in ways that really connected with people. And he was used of God to really uh, start a church planting movement uh, within the Philadelphia Presbytery. Um, and I was a part of that. I planted a church in Northeast Philadelphia uh, trying to reach the working class uh, for Jesus uh, because I are one. Uh, I am a working class guy uh, who happened to stumble through Westminster Seminary, and we, uh, after we left uh, pastoral ministry, um, we started, I went back into construction and uh, ended up getting involved in doing construction projects in Latin America through the mission that Jack Miller started, um, and then we eventually felt the call to move to Chile and, and did a shift away from construction to uh, just really helping people get clear about the gospel and how the gospel is for everyday life. That's what we were doing, especially um, pastoral leadership. So that's uh, a little bit uh, about us. Uh, my wife and I are Pennsylvania Dutch. Do we have any other Pennsylvania Dutch here tonight? 
<laughs> and uh, grew up in central Pennsylvania, uh, met and married, and uh, again went to seminary and all that jazz. It was rough. But um, God is good, and this calling with C. Jesus for me is, su I am super uh, psyched about what C. Jesus is and about uh, what we're doing. And I was sharing with um, your, I guess that was more or less your leadership team at supper uh, just a bit ago, that what we are, see Jesus is a discipling uh, mission. We feel like Jesus said some important stuff about that uh, and that that's got to be really central uh, in the life of the church. And so we are a mission that is working to multiply disciple makers is what we're doing. Uh, and we, ha this prayer seminar is one resource. You know, we feel like if we really believe Jesus is the head of the church, we ought to talk to him uh, a bit. And so uh, this is part of that, trying to get Jesus at the center of the life of the church. See we want to see Jesus at the heart of the church and at the heart of your Christian, your Christian walk as well. Um, so that's a little bit about us as a mission. We're actually an international mission. As, uh, as I said, I'm the coordinator for Latin America. And so what we do is uh, I'm based. We had family stuff going on that brought us home from Chile. And uh, so what See Jesus is letting me do is to live in Philadelphia, and I travel to Latin America four to six times a year doing discipleship training and trying to raise up. Uh, I'm trying to invest actually in uh, like a half a dozen or a dozen key leaders that will take this ball and run with it. I uh, So I've got several apprentices throughout Latin America that I'm working with and sending them around Latin America and actually even into Europe. Uh, one of my guys has gone over into Europe uh, doing this discipleship training. Um, uh, so uh, it's just exciting stuff. I have way more to do than I can uh, shake a stick at. Why am I here? Um, this seminar, we are getting so many requests for this seminar that they pulled me into it. Uh, so you got stuck with me tonight. Uh, and, but I won't speak in Spanish. Um, I'll, uh, I'll do this in, in English. Uh, I am not related to Paul Miller. His family's from Oregon. My, I'm from central Pennsylvania, Lancaster County. Um, but I have known him a long time, and I've had the privilege of knowing his family, his, uh, his mom and dad. I have some stories about them. Uh, in this seminar. Is that good enough about me? Do you understand a little bit about uh, who I am or, and who we are as a mission? I could talk a whole lot more uh, about us as a mission. I will mention that we've got some of these discipling resources over here on the table. Uh, and specifically, the one that I work with primarily in Latin America is this Person of Jesus study, which is an inductive Bible study that draws students into the text of the scripture through questions. It's really cool. So there's interaction. So when I lead seminars like this in Latin America, you know, people are jumping out of their seat, literally, to respond uh, to the questions and to what they're discovering in the text of scripture and what they're discovering primarily about Jesus. It's focused on the gospel um, and learning to know Jesus as a person. Um, I think that's I think that's enough. I'd like to launch into this. Uh, we're going till 9.30 tonight. We'll take a break uh, in, a, in an hour or so, right? We'll take a little, take a little break in a bit. Okay, this is, a, this is a prayer seminar, if you didn't know that. Maybe you're in the wrong room. Uh, and so w the way that I would like to start just now is to pray. And I want to ask you to pray silently in your seat. Let's pray.
Okay, now, uh, you guys are going to have to help me. Do we have a roving mic, by the way, or can we have a couple of them, this one? Can somebody man this? This is a, this is a bit interactive, okay, this seminar. Uh, what was, well, let me start by saying this. Prayer is difficult. I mean, for some of you, uh, that these moments that we just took might have been super sweet, and you came away feeling in, enlightened and refreshed, and it was really personal with Jesus. But I have a hunch that that's not the, ma the majority of you. And I'm talking about this five minutes that we just spent in prayer. I don't think it was even five minutes. So talk to me about, about this. Talk to me about this five minutes. How did how did that go for you just now? You're gonna have to help me here. Some of you're gonna have to speak up. Yeah. <clears throat> On a Friday evening, <laughs> after working all week, right? It, yeah. To just sit and do nothing felt so good. Oh, um, okay. That's however, the wrong answer. <laughs> however. To stay in prayer for five minutes is another story for me, yeah. um, which is why I'm here. So to think that I'm speaking to Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, and I couldn't stay focused for five minutes okay, is very well, discouraging. That's an honest confession. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Anybody else? How was that? Yeah, in the back there. I was at a funeral today in Kearney, New Jersey, and got to meet Father... Richard Moroz, M-O-O-Z, had a wonderful conversation with this senior saint, uh, retired from ministry and yet still in it, explained his life to me and, and, and my, my, the friend that I was with, uh, who we work in the funeral business, mm -hmm. and I just prayed for his future. He, he went into ministry late, mm -hmm. was a Vietnam vet. And it was just an interesting man. We had more of a, an in-depth conversation, which I won't go into now. But mm -hmm. I just think that was a divine appointment that God gave me. And, and how did that, how'd that affect your five minutes of prayer just now? I prayed for him, okay. for his life, All right. for his walks All right. um, in the woods that he said he takes when he wants to get away. Okay. And um, that type of thing. All right. Somebody else. I want to hear what was difficult. I know that some of you found that time difficult. I know. <laughs> what was difficult about it? How many of you heard me drop my pen up here? Okay. Distractions, right? Somebody knocked over a coffee cup, right? Did you hear that? What else? Where did your mind go? If you're free to tell us, <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Ah. Okay. Mm -hmm. He started out praying for his own needs and then eventually he remembered the, the uh, mission that you're on as a church and uh, redirected himself a little bit. What else? What else was difficult about that? Speak to me, people. I'm a, I'm a real guy. I am not a prayer expert, okay? So, yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. She started out with the Lord's Prayer and then moved to praying Him. Who had trouble with it? Yeah. 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 Mm hmm. Okay. To memorize the Lord's Prayer. Right. Probably most of us have memorized. Yeah. And also the Apostles' Creed mm -hmm. and the Ten Commandments. And then when you're praying, yeah. to meditate on each of those truths. Okay. And go from there. I think that was Martin Luther's barber. 
Yes. I it think it was yeah, Martin Luther's it was. barber. It was Martin Luther's yeah. barber, yeah. yes. Yeah. And um, I've been going through talking about that with my grandson. Okay. But I just figured, well, I had all this time because I knew yeah. what you were going <laughs> to try for, and so I started doing it. All right. So that's well, what I did. Okay. I don't know if anybody was like me. I started with just, you know, praising and praying for the room and for all of us to come away with something. And then said for him to say amen. <laughs> and it, he didn't. <laughs> so I went back to him. But I found that I was distracted by yeah. wondering what was coming next. Right. And so that's where my mind went. And I realized yeah. that I wasn't really praying because I was expecting. Yeah. So it's, and then all of those other little things that you're saying. Anybody yeah. else? Yeah. How many, how many were wondering, like, when's this over? Okay. Uh, did you notice I didn't give you any instructions? I didn't tell you what to pray for. I did that deliberately. Yeah, over here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. How many of you had bad thoughts about me? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's going to confess. Well, I'm glad yes, you I'm glad you said that you didn't give any instructions because yeah. I was raising my hand to say I must have missed the instruction uh -huh. because yeah. I asked God in his indivisible state, not just Jesus per se, mm -hmm. to be with us that we could hear him that mm -hmm. he could hear us, and that we would have a really productive evening. So I was done in about 20 seconds. Uh-huh, right. Uh, and I, yeah, I okay. put some praise in. Yeah. Um, and then I sat there for four more minutes thinking, okay, well, you really screwed up. But I wouldn't let myself go back into prayer because, yeah. and this was the serendipitous moment, uh -huh. I had asked for the essentials, and I didn't mm -hmm. want to ask for anything above that. Uh -huh. And so I sat here and had a little fight with myself in my head yeah, yeah. about what am I allowed to ask God for. Uh -huh. Good. We're going to get into that. Okay. So prayer is, hold on a minute. I, you, can, you can respond. I just want to expand this a little bit. Prayer, can, can we admit together that prayer is difficult? Okay. We, we're starting there. It is difficult. Why is prayer difficult for us? Speak to me. Can you respond to that in the back there? Why is prayer difficult for us? Over here. Yeah. It is so hard to center, sorry. It is so hard to center your mind. I mean, what I was going to say right now when we were just praying, um, I mean, I, sp I probably spent the first 60 seconds actually in real prayer, and the next thing you know, I'm, pr I'm thinking about what I have to do tomorrow and what, right. you know, and that's just where, and then I, I right, center it right. back in, but it's just back and forth, back and forth. So it's just, uh, you know, especially again with uh, everything is go, 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 and then when you get home, yeah. you're tired, you turn on the TV, you start thinking about other things. Yeah. Right, distractions. Why else is prayer difficult for us? Yes, ma'am. Speak. Just speak up. Yeah, very good. Um, you, you know, I don't know how to do it. Uh, I don't know. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, because I think we're in a spiritual battle. Mm, and Satan, very good. Satan doesn't want us to pray because prayer is one of our greatest yep. weapons in that battle. Amen. Yes, you have an enemy. You have an enemy in this. Why else is it difficult for us? Uh huh. Yeah, you're way ahead of me. Yeah, 
we're going to go there. Uh, we're going we're gonna to spend some time in that. Why is prayer difficult for us? It takes humility uh -huh. to enter in the presence of Almighty God. Mm -hmm. I'm proud. Yeah, that goes. That touches on the childlike, the childlike theme. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm kind of a doer, ah, and I'd rather yeah. be doing something. Yeah, yeah. So to me, prayer is like right. If all else fails. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not. I'm not doing anything. Not. Not doing. Yeah. There's no other relationship where you're not talking to someone face to face or on the phone. Yeah. So, yeah. like, this is going to sound horrible, but yeah. you're talking to an imaginary friend, right? Because you can't physically right. see God. So, th I think just in a very practical way, that makes it difficult. Very good. Very good. It's hard to not get a response. You know, uh, you, we we don't we don't get a response. Tip, you don't hear audible voices at least presbyterians don't maybe <laughs> some of the rest of you yeah we are pentecostals so oh so there no. you go um, no, i'm just kidding um <laughs> uh, well i'm not no um also i think that sometimes prayer just gets a little rote sometimes it can ah. become boring if you've done it yeah for a yeah while and uh mechanical yeah do you want to hear what some of your uh brothers and sisters across the river think <laughs> uh in uh in philadelphia uh, I think a lot about myself. Uh, I prayed three minutes and dr daydreamed two minutes. Um, my mind floats. It feels like I'm praying to a spiritual being who doesn't want to talk to me. Philadelphians are pretty hard. Is the five minutes up yet? <laughs> Uh, it's hard to be still. Uh, it's hard to be silent. I fall asleep in prayer. I, if I haven't prayed for a while, catching up is overwhelming. How do you like that one? <laughs> it feels like a chore. Do I need to say things in the right order? some of the responses of your brothers and sisters on the other side of the river. So prayer is um, prayer is is difficult. That's the premise that I want to start with tonight. That it, I, I don't want to uh, some of this uh, is, I mean this is so basic for us as Christians because you know we, we really have a tendency to you know butter ourselves up to we to polish ourselves up not butter ourselves up polish ourselves up and present something that's not real if we're going to experience growth in our life of prayer you have to start with being honest that prayer is difficult and and i don't really like it and i don't like talking to myself so uh that's the premise that we're kind of starting out with that it is, it is difficult, and we can own that, that it's difficult. Okay? Now, I want to shift a little bit. One of the big themes that Jack Miller, my, my Paul's dad that I mentioned earlier, one of the big themes that he developed was sonship, what's called sonship. And that is that we are, uh, by faith in Christ, we are sons of, uh, of God, uh, sons, and in this in this setting, I'll say daughters. Uh, and actually, the Bible says sons, and it says that for a reason. It's because in the in the day that the Bible was written, sons had all the rights. So when when the scriptures say that I, that you as a woman are a son, it means you have the same rights that Jesus had. So we're all sons and daughters of God, right? We believe that here at First Press, right? Okay. Um, and that's different than what we hear said in the world, that we're all children of God. Now, this is a more, and in a sense, that's true, but this is a more specific thing that has to do with justification by faith and sitting in 
the gospel. I am a son of God, not because I'm good at praying, not because I'm faithful in my church attendance, not because I obey the speed limit. Ooh. I'm a very aggressive driver. So, um, you know, it's, it doesn't have anything to do with my performance, right? It has to do with righteousness given from the Father, received by faith. Paul says in Romans 5, it is a righteousness that is received by faith. And all the Pentecostals say, amen. All right? So it starts there. Your prayer life has to start there, too. You can be a real sinner <laughs> before God in your prayer life. Prayer is difficult, and we can own that. We can embrace that because we are sons of God. But if um, so, we believe that we are sons of God. Uh, the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians six eighteen. You'll see this here in your manual. This this manual that you have, by the way, is for your note. You you can take notes in here and follow along. You'll uh, I'll, I'll mostly follow this. And, uh, and it's mostly for you to take notes. That's what this is for. So scribble it up. Um, so in 2 Corinthians 6.18, the Apostle Paul says, I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now, God is your father. But if you went to a, um, a prayer therapist uh, to help you with your relationship with God, um, and the prayer therapist uh, asks you this. Tell me about your relationship with your Heavenly Father. How would you answer? Speak to me. In Spanish, it's dígame. <laughs> Tell me what, it, what does it mean for us as believers in Christ? What does it mean that God is our Father? What's some of that, what does that mean for us? Yeah. Okay, he's in charge. He's got everything under control in your life, right? Good, good. Yeah, I'm not necessarily looking for big theological definition unless you want to do that, but I mean, what does it mean for you to be a son of God or a daughter of God? Yes. He created you. I belong to him. Amen. Yeah, you belong to him. You're his. What does it mean if he's if if you are his? What does that mean? Go ahead. Ultimately, I'm doing everything for him. Everything he does is ultimately for my benefit. There you go. Good. Very, very good. Everything that he does in my life is for my good. Mm -hmm. I'm loved. I'm your love. Absolutely. What else does the father? What does it mean that you're you? that God is your father. For me, for me it's that um, he has placed uh, joy in my life. Good. That I'm able to feel joyful in times that maybe uh, are difficult. Good. Okay. But where does that come from? What's that based on? Why do you have joy in the midst of difficulty? Um, because I know he has saved me and mm -hmm. I belong to him. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He protects me. Yep. And and um, I forgot the other word. Um, he just takes care of me. Provides. Like, provides like a father yeah. here, but yes, even yeah. that much yeah. better. Good. One more. I think it means he takes responsibility for me. Good. Yeah. Very good. Okay. That's all good stuff. He protects, he provides, he walks with me day by day, he guides my, he guides me, he, uh, you know, I, I have a perfect relationship with him because of what Christ has done, you know, we can go on and on, my sins are forgiven, he wants to hear my prayers, some of that stuff, but, you're gonna ask, I'm going to ask you to be honest again. What does it look like day, you know, day by day? 
some of you be honest? Yeah. Inconsistent. Wow. Thank you, sister. Yeah. Absolutely. That's in my notes. Yeah, there's the, you know, objectively we know it here, but the, the practical reality, it's down here. You know, there's this disconnect. Right. How else? What, what does it look like day to day? Well, we talked in this church the first week about how God first, we're second, or others are second and we're third. But mm -hmm. many days when you go into your routine and get into your habit, he's not first. We yeah. just, we get, you know, into our own thing and he's, he's not first. That's right. Yeah. It's not thy kingdom come, it's my kingdom come. Yeah. We're still at times consumed by worry and fear. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So... We say all this cool stuff about having God as a father, you know, that we learn in Sunday school, but our daily reality is something different. So there's a, there's a disconnect um, in our lives. So if, um, you know, if someone is talking to you uh, about their father and saying, wow, He's been a great dad. He really uh, is the one that has supported me through the years and made me what I am. He's been there uh, for me. He's disciplined me well, uh, you know, not only when I needed it, but just in terms of guiding me and so forth, et cetera, et cetera. But then the person goes on to say, but, you know, I don't, I don't really want to be with him. Uh, it's kind of boring. And, uh, you know, he's, I just don't like to talk to him. What's going? What's wrong there? What do we call that in our society? It's a big D word. Dysfunctional. It takes them a longer time to come up with that in Latin America. <laughs> I think because their families are a little, maybe a little better. But anyway, that's a dysfunctional relationship. So we have this. We have this dysfunction in our Christian walk, and it has to do uh, with, I mean, it reflects then in, our, in the way that we pray. It reflects in our prayer life. There's, there's this disconnect. So what I want to do now, I think you can sit down now for a while with the microphone, Joyce. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about uh, five things that make for a good prayer life and or that define good prayer and then these uh, these five things are you know going to sort of form the basis of our study uh, through the weekend um, so the first thing is that uh, that prayer is a, a feast Prayer is like a feast, or, you know, for uh, us uh, 21st century types, it's a party, okay? It's a party. In Revelation 3.20, uh, uh, are you familiar with this passage where Jesus uh, is standing at the door knocking? Do you remember that famous picture of that, that uh, I, f I forget who painted that thing. It's got some theological problems, but it's still kind of amazing. Here I am, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Did you hear that? That verse is written to the church, right? That's in Revelation 3 where John, uh, where the Spirit of God is speaking to John uh, to write the seven churches uh, that were throughout Asia Minor. And that's one of the things that said, I think it might be to the Church of Laodicea. I don't, I don't remember. But what does Jesus say that he wants to come in and do? He wants to eat. Do you think like that in your prayer life? He wants to come in and eat. And it's interesting the way it's put. I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Isn't that rich? It's reciprocal. 
We're going to hang out and enjoy one another's presence and one another's company. Jesus is, does not say, open up and I'll come in and check out what you're watching on TV. Or I want to see what apps you have on your telephone. I want to see how clean your house is for you Pennsylvania Dutch people like me. I want to see how you discipline your children. He doesn't say that. Do you hear Jesus? I want to come in and have a feast with you. Now, how many of you think of prayer as feasting? It's a feast with Jesus. You know, um, my mom, uh, there were seven kids in my family, and uh, my mom, I was, I was telling the group again at, at supper that my mom really kept a clean house. And she was really good at uh, delegating and at teaching us to do it. <laughs> so after dinner, um, she taught the boys. It was four boys and then three girls. So I grew up learning how to wash dishes. We washed the dishes, and she sat at the table and drank coffee and talked to my dad. And, you know, if you think about in your, and they talked with each other, you know, while his kids were working, slaving away. But if you think about, maybe you come from, uh, do we have any good Italians here? <laughs> uh you know, you think about an Italian dinner. And after the dinner's over, what happens? What goes on? Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> that sounds like Pennsylvania Dutch land, too. But no, there's, uh, isn't there sitting around, maybe even during the meal, you're talking, telling stories, maybe roughing each other up a little bit verbally, there's this banter that goes on, but there's a, a delight. There's a delight in the feast. So isn't it that way at Thanksgiving? Hopefully, I mean, I know that Thanksgiving, sometimes that can be a tense time for some people, but the way it's supposed to be is you're supposed to be interacting and sharing your lives one another. That's what prayer is. And I'm, I'm trying to help you right now to shift gears in your mind about what prayer is. And Jesus says, I want to come in, and I want to eat with you. I want to spend time with you. I want to get to know you. I want you to get to know me. You don't know me. And I want you to get to know me. So, first of all, uh, prayer is a, a feast. Secondly, prayer is primarily relationship. Um, and really what I'm trying to get you to, to do here is to shift in your thinking about the, uh, how do you say it in English? The uh, it's, it's like an obligation. We think of prayer, we think primarily obligation. It is an obligation, but it's supposed to come out of relationship. You know, so if you have a sweet relationship with another human being, it's a delight to be with them. You talk, you, sh you share your lives with one another. In the New Testament, who are all the theologians here uh, tonight? Who is central? My son knows that every answer in Sunday school is Jesus. So who is central in the New Testament? Jesus. Jesus is central in the New Testament, not prayer. Okay, we're at a prayer seminar, okay? That, that was just some bad advertising right there. But what is central in, the, in throughout the, really the whole scriptures is a relationship with God as Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. And, it's, and so it's all about relationship. Prayer is about being with a person. It's about 
It's like the after dinner thing where you're engaging and you're reflecting together. You're talking. You, t- you can tell jokes. How many of you do jokes in prayer? I'm getting better at that. I make the staff at See Jesus laugh all the time in our prayer meeting. But there's communication going on. So if you go back to that analogy of the th- you know after the Thanksgiving meal and you're having good engagement with one another, what what are you thinking about? What's on your mind? You're thinking about the, the person, right? You're thinking about who they are. You're thinking about what they just said. You're not thinking about the words. And I think a lot of times in prayer, we get tied up with words. And we get off focus on, on the relationship. And so... Prayer is to be like a a conversation with the divine being. It's supposed to be fellowship. It's like a, uh, I think a great analogy is a windshield. Good prayer is like a windshield. So uh, when you drove here tonight, did you stare at the windshield the whole time you were driving? No. Is a windshield important? Yeah. Do you sometimes focus on the windshield? Yeah. If the rain come, starts coming down, you turn on those uh, windshield wipers. I can't think in English. And, uh, you know, sometimes you have to clean the windshield. But when you're driving, if you look just at the windshield, it would be a catastrophe. You look through the windshield. And prayer, that's what prayer is. You're, you're working through prayer. You're looking through prayer to the relationship that you have with your heavenly father. It's not about the windshield. It's not about it's not about getting the words right. It's not about uh, being theologically accurate for all you good presbyterians. It's not about that. It's about a relationship and we're going to we're going to expand on that uh, a little bit later on. Prayer thirdly is um, it's connected uh, it's connected to every other part. I need to write this all out. Of the Christian life. Life. Don't be offended by the X for Jesus. That's the first letter in his name in Greek. I probably should. Um, so uh, prayer is connected to every other part um, of the Christian life, and so each part, each part of the what are what are some of the parts of the Christian life? What you have? There's faith, obedience, um, repentance. Uh, yeah, service. Good. So there's all there's all different aspects of the Christian life, and so and so they're all connected with each other. So um, if you have, I hope I hope you can see this. If this is prayer, and you have over here um, your big your big theme as a church right now, love. Um, you have over here faith. There's a Spanish word for you, okay? Fe. Um, and then uh, suffering. You could add you could add repentance in here and so forth. So how does this work? This is prayer. If I if I am in a situation where I I cannot love I cannot love my friend. Has anybody ever been there? I can't love this person that I work on. Can't love them. What do I do? I I pray. You know, I pray for love, and and the Lord responds, and I find a new thing happening in my heart. And what that does then is that if when I find this new love rising in my heart, it moves me again to pray more. So it's it's reciprocal. If you think about repentance and prayer. In, in prayer, I move into repentance. I see my sin. I confess my sin. I turn away from my sin to Jesus. 
not to try harder, to Jesus. And when that, that sense that the Spirit gives me that my sins are forgiven, what does that do? It moves. How many have, how many know their sins are forgiven? When you feel, when you have that spirit given sense, my, I am not guilty. My sins are pardoned. My sins are forgiven. Man, that moves. That moves you to prayer and praise. It moves you right back there. You're in suffering. I, I think there's probably suffering in Moorestown, New Jersey, right? If you're suffering, it moves you to call out on the Lord. He gives the Spirit, and He gives you a sense of comfort and relief through a friend, through the Scriptures, through a hymn, uh, through a John uh, uh, Bob Dylan song. I, mean, I don't know what He uses. Gives you relief, and you give Him thanks. It moves you back to Him. So it's all connected. It's all interconnected. The Christian life and prayer. Um, and then fourthly. Fourthly, prayer is story. Prayer is a story. And by prayer, this, is a, this has been a life-transforming point for many people. And I am not going to be able to come back to this point in this seminar. I don't have enough time. So I'm going to elaborate it a little bit more now. In prayer... You enter into the story that God is writing. So how does that work? Um, so here is, uh, you know, here's my conversion, and uh, and this is my Christian life going along here. And uh, oops, at one point, at one point, you know, I come into a crisis in my life. And I, I am moved uh, to prayer. So here I am down on my knees, you know, praying. What's going on? Am I bumping this thing? Do you know what I'm doing? Oh, it automatically closed because my hand was in there. Um, can you see what I'm, can you make out one? It's not, you know, it's not a great draw, drawing. But there's a, there's a timeline going on in your life. And at a certain point in your life, you may experience a lot of uh, crisis, suffering, and you are moved to prayer. And you may feel, in your prayer closet, you feel God is not answering. This is one of the best things to help you remedy the sense that praying doesn't matter and God's not listening. That God is writing a story. You enter into that story by prayer, but you can only see this. You can only see that much. You can't see what he's doing. You can't see where, you know, where his providence has been, and you don't know where it's going. You don't know the beginning and the end. He does. He's writing a story. And in some mysterious way, in some mysterious way, when I pray, I enter into the story that God is writing, and in some way... I affect that story. I'm a good Presbyterian, okay? <laughs> it's mysterious. I don't know how it works with his sovereignty. But we engage in the story that God is writing, and he will respond. Now, he might not respond in exactly the way that you think he's going to respond. And I, I do hope to talk more about... Um, you know, what, when we're praying, and it's, it just feels like God's not listening. He's not answering my prayers. But this is part of the remedy, to understand that in prayer, you're entering into the story that God is writing, and you can't see the whole end and beginning. So what's the response? Keep praying. You keep praying, and what kicks in? What, what is it that kicks in that enables you to keep praying? The Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit activates what in my heart? Trust, faith. Yeah, and perseverance, which is a, you know, a, a close cousin to faith. So faith, I, I pray in faith, knowing that my Father 
He's got it all. He is going to move. He is going to bring glory to his name. He is going to bring relief. He is, his kingdom is coming when I engage. Make sense? Do you follow that? So prayer is entering into um, the story that God is writing. And then fifthly, prayer is an adventure. Okay, this is all, you know, we're uh, doing a you know, mind change here, a mind shift. It's an adventure. And in part, this refers back to this last point. It's because it's an adventure because I, I don't know where the story's going to go. It's kind of exciting. I don't know what he's going to do. And he's probably going to do more than I could even begin to ask or imagine. That's what the Apostle Paul says. He's going to do more than you can even imagine. So there's a sense in which we enter into a prayer in, in, uh, as an adventure. In our, uh, I, and I will say that as a mission, we practice prayer. Uh, we have three prayer meetings a week uh, as a staff. And um, one of the guys, well, the guy that, that heads up a praying life uh, kind of division of our mission, his name is Bob Olive. And sometimes Bob will lead these prayer meetings. You know, we're meeting by Zoom. So, you know, we're kind of all, we're all over the world and all over the country, and we're praying. And sometimes Bob will say, hey, can't you get this big thing? Okay, let's, let's have some fun. <laughs> what he's saying is, let's pray. <laughs> but what he says is, let's have fun. Let's see what Jesus does. And there's something, you know, there's something really exciting about that. I, I, I mean, I wish um, one of the one of the dreams. You know, this is Martin Luther King's uh, birthday month. Um, I just sent this. Esther and I just sent this out in an update today. You know, we write these like prayer update things. One of the things that has been a dream of ours for years is has been even before we went to Chile was to see Latinos going with the gospel. We lived in Chile. How many of you are familiar with the geography of Chile? Okay, it's a long skinny country, it's three thousand miles long. And the average width of the country is right around two hundred miles. Some places it's only twelve miles wide. Well, a missionary that we befriended uh, when we were living down there, uh, he had been there a long time, and he, he used to say, Chileans only think north and south. They don't think east and west. What, what's to the east of Chile? Does anybody know? The Andes Mountains, yeah. Second largest mountain range in the world. You don't go to the Andes to build up your self-esteem. And then what's on the west? It's the Pacific Ocean. They, they, don't, they don't think across the ocean, and they don't think over the mountains. They only think north and south. Or, yeah, north and south. And, and, so, and that's very true of a lot of Latin America, or has been. It's, I think God's really changing. And God is answering our prayers. He's answering my prayers to see Latinos going with the gospel. And so I was working today on trying to coordinate a guy, a guy, uh, one of our trainers from Chile, to go into Venezuela. Who wants to live in Venezuela? He's going to go into Venezuela, and he's going to take a trainer that I've been working with in Cali, Colombia, and they're going to hook up and go into Venezuela together to do discipleship, to do this person of Jesus discipleship training uh, with, a, with a network of uh, like 30 churches. Isn't that cool? I've been praying for that for years, that they would go. And there's all kinds of reasons that I could go into about why Latinos don't think about that very much. Some of it's our fault, actually, uh, in the North. But, 
they are they are the beginning I'm beginning to see God answer prayers that I've made. I'm seeing it happen in my ministry. It's an adventure. It's it's really cool. It's really exciting. Now, um, I want to give you I want to give you uh, three three cautions in prayer. Okay. Um, I'm just going to, I'll just give, give you these verbally, but you can write these down. Did, do you have that there in your book, Three Cautions? Yeah, okay, that's where I am. Uh, the first caution is that when God begins to give you a rich prayer life, uh, you need to be careful about how you talk about it. Who knows where that comes from, that caution? What's, what does Jesus say about what our prayer lives, where should you go to pray? In your closet. And you don't broadcast, the Pharisees used to have someone go ahead of them broadcasting that they were coming, you know, to pray. And that's what Jesus is really going after. But there is some kind of a, uh, there is some kind of a, a dynamic that when I begin to talk too much about my prayer life, it kills prayer. Uh, and, you know, that's a little bit of a problem for me uh, doing this seminar. Uh, what I try to do is I tell you all my bad stuff, all the bad praying that I'm good at. No, that's not true. But there is, there is some kind of a, a, di a dynamic. Um, does somebody have a Bible? Uh, could, they turn, could you turn to Matthew 6 and stand up and read in a, in a loud voice? Matthew chapter 6. 5 to 8. Matthew 6, 5 to 8. This is this passage that I was just referring to. Matthew 6, verse 5 to 8. That's, there's the dynamic. We're to, we're to pray in secret. Um, does that mean there's no place for corporate public prayer? No, it's not what this is about at all. But, uh, but the, the, the way that, we've, the way that w we flesh this out, I think, is to say, let, you know, don't brag about uh, what God is doing when he begins to respond to your prayers because it kills it. Henry Nouwen uh, has written that prayer is kind of like a, uh, a cabin in the woods in the wintertime with a nice roaring fire in the fireplace. Has anybody ever been there? Do you guys go to a Poconos or anything? I guess nobody goes to a Poconos. But I've been up in the Poconos in exactly that setting. Snowed in, a fire going in the fireplace, you know, with my baby by my side. And it's rich. Well, Henry Naron says that, that when you talk about your prayer life, it's sort of like somebody comes and opens the door of the cabin and leaves it standing open. What happens? It's kind of a chill. That it changes the whole atmosphere. Well, that's, what's, that's what it's like if we talk too much about our prayer life when God begins to really move in our lives. It's going to change the atmosphere. It's going gonna, it's gonna to change the dynamic. It's going to get a little chilly. Uh, in your prayer closet. So be careful. The second one is, uh, the second question is that um, if you use a system of prayer, you need to be careful. We're, we're, I actually am hoping to get to introducing to you a system of prayer using cards. But we, you, you still have to be careful of that. And I know there's a number of different 
there's a number of different systems of prayer out there. Maybe you're familiar with the ACTS, A-C-T-S, Adoration, Confession. What is it? Thankfulness and supplication. I didn't use that system. But, you know, if... Uh, You know, pastor comes down in the morning, uh, you know, rolls out of bed, his wife's got coffee done, they sit down at the kitchen table. This happens, right, pastor? Yeah. And uh, he starts with uh, his wife's adoration. Oh, honey, you look beautiful. You know, what are the things from Song of Solomon? You know, your eyes are like doves. You follow me? He gets through that pretty quick, and then he uh, the next thing on his list is uh, confession. But I, you know, I have to, I have to, I have to tell you something. You know, I, I backed the car into a tree today, uh, and so he does his confession thing, and then he's giving thanks. But thank you, honey. Thanks for washing the clothes. Thank you for being there. Thank you for all the hard work that you do with the kids. Blah blah blah. And then he goes into supplication. But but you know. Could you please keep the stuff picked up a little better? You know, it doesn't. Does it work like that? No. Why? Why doesn't Why doesn't that work for the pastor in the morning? It's mechanical. It's mechanical, and it doesn't. It doesn't come from relationship. You know, he's thinking about his list. And we can do that in our, in our prayer life. I mean, even using the Lord's Prayer. You know, the Lord's Prayer was a system of prayer that Jesus gave us. It's divinely given. But you need to be careful because we're, we're talking about a relationship. And so it starts, the, the Lord's Prayer starts out, Our Father. Our Father in Heaven. So you need to be careful about that and, and not get uh, too hung up with your system. And then the third thing uh, that I would say is that praying, good praying, uh, and this doesn't sound like a caution, but good praying is possible. The caution is it's not easy. It takes work. It takes, it takes work, and it takes discipline, and it takes commitment. It takes keeping at it to, to grow in your life of prayer. It's, um, you know, how many of you remember the first time you rode a bicycle? <laughs> How'd that go? It was a disaster. I remember my oldest daughter, um, she first rode a two-wheel bike when she was three and a half years old. Somebody gave us a uh, little plastic bike, and she wanted to ride that thing. And so I took her out behind our house, and we had this nice hill. I put her on there, three and a half, and <laughs> she ran into the neighbor's house, and they came running out and kind of chewed me out. What are you doing? It didn't go so well. So I, you know, I imagine for some of you, that's how riding a bicycle was the first time. So it's going to be like that in prayer, too. You can grow in it. It's just It takes keeping at it and, and continuing to work at it. Coming to a seminar like this is a great way um, to do that. So um, that's what I have uh, to start us off. Those five, keep in mind those five good things of prayer. I think we're going to get to four of them. We're going to flesh out four of them over the next day. Um, but, uh, and then keep these three cautions in mind. Let me, let me just pray. I'll pray, okay? And, uh, and then we'll take uh, a little break. Yeah, okay. 15 minutes? No? 10 minutes? 5 minutes? 5.6 minutes? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are, we are thankful uh, for the way that has been opened to us by your death and resurrection. And we want to enter into all that you have for us uh, in this new relationship that we have with the Father. And so deepen that in us, Father, and bless us in these uh, hours together over the next couple of days to know you and to understand more fully.
fully what it means uh, to walk with you in this manner and to delight in what in your grace you have given us uh, in this walk of faith. We give you thanks through Christ. Amen. Okay, let's take a break and try to be back close to 10 up.
thanks for coming, guys. Great to be here. Yeah. Okay, folks. Hey, Don. Hey, man. Nice to meet you. Yeah, good to meet I'm you. Al. Hey, Al. Let me, let me ask you a question here. I keep yeah. on, I look at, you know, your five and all of that. Yeah. But I still look at the, the most important aspect of prayer. Mm -hmm. It's a commandment. It is. It's yeah. a commandment. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He doesn't stop all through the New Testament. He I know. never stops telling us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We're trying to help you enjoy it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but it is a commandment. Yeah. We are, if we believe and we understand or uh, we accept it, yeah. which I think that's the hardest part. Right, We right. don't want to be told what to do. Right, We right. don't want, you know, right. even with the same with the, new, with the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. It's not, it's not all words. Right. But anyway, yeah. it's hard. Good word, bro. Yep. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Let's take hey, our seats. We lived in Philly. Oh, did you? Right next yeah. to Fruitville Christian School. Oh. So we were yeah. going into the fall. Yeah. Although it's been 30 years. Yeah, he was Over a principal. 30 years. Yeah. I don't know if I'd recognize him. No. We he, worshiped. He's him. still. He, he's, he still looks pretty much the same. Yeah. Okay, let's take our seats. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write down a, a number of passages of Scripture, and I'd like some of you to uh, look these up and 
uh, read them in a big voice, as we say in Spanish. Uh, Can some of you be looking these up? Uh, okay. I want to I want to talk to you in this session about um, being a child. Uh, before your your heavenly father, a child childlikeness is a central theme in the teachings of Jesus. He talks a lot about being like children, and uh, if you're you know struggling to see that, um, we're going to look at these uh, passages. Who has uh, Mark ten thirteen to sixteen? Mark ten. 13 to 16 over here. Yeah. You ready? People were bringing little children to Jesus to have, to have him touch them, but the despi disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, and he put his hands on them and blessed them. Amen. So what you see here, what does Jesus say about entering the kingdom? It's pretty stiff. You cannot enter unless you're like a child. You can't enter it. I wanna, I'm going to do a little parenthesis advertisement right here, okay? For the person of Jesus study that's over here. We look at this passage in the person of Jesus, and it's very interesting that what you see, if you look closely, you, what does it say about Jesus when his disciples were shooing them away? What's the description? He was indignant. Do you think of Jesus as being indignant? You know, we read that passage in our churches when we baptize children. Let the little children come. <laughs> I think it's more like, let the little children come. What are you doing? Can you picture Jesus doing that? He's indignant because they have violated, they violated an axiom of his kingdom. You can't enter it if you're not like a child. So it, that's a little ad for the, the person of Jesus study. I forget, I don't know where the, the pastors went, but that we were talking about that at supper. Um, and that would, that's an example of how we look closely at the text of the scripture to learn about who Jesus really was. We have these ideas in our head about what he's like that aren't, he's, he was a real man who yelled at the disciples sinlessly yelled at them <laughs> okay all right back to our study so um, this uh, this is a kind of a shocking thing for us and we have a hard time processing this what do you mean you know we are te trying to teach our children to grow up and not act like kids and Jesus is throwing a curve into that and actually saying, you can't even enter the kingdom of God unless you become like a little child. We're, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more. Matthew 18, 1 to 6. What does that say? Who has Matthew 18, 1 to 6? Some of you be looking up these, these uh, other passages. Pull, please. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth. 
Unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it will be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Mm. Powerful stuff. This is uh, Jesus holding up a child and their behavior as a model for us and how we should behave, trusting. And if you can't do that, and let me tell you, may I speak to you as fellow members of the United States of America, this is very hard for us in the north, in the northern hemisphere. It's very hard for us to become childlike in trusting uh, our Heavenly Father. That's what he's calling on us to do. Uh, the next one there, uh, Luke 11. 11 to 13. This is probably Jesus' primary teaching on prayer. The son asks for a fish. Will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Good. So the, the point in that verse is the activity of the child. What's the child doing of the Father? Asking. He's asking. He's asking for bread. He's asking uh, for a fish. Uh, I mean, Jesus goes on to point out that the Father is not going to uh, be like our fathers he will respond and give us what we ask uh, of him but the point uh, for us right now is just that children ask do you ask uh, your father uh, Luke 10 17 uh, Luke 10 17 I think just read 17 and 21 and the Fine. 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through your name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you, notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and has revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. Amen. So Jesus, Jesus is rejoicing that the, the, that the disciples are learning like little children. They're being taught like little children. They drink in whatever Jesus says. You know, you know how it is with a little kid and their dad. Whatever dad says, man, you know, that's the way it is. And that's how they are with him. He's telling them, don't be happy that the devils are subject to you and that you're calling down fire from heaven or whatever. Be happy that your names are written. And they're listening, man. They're soaking it up, and Jesus says, you've revealed this to babes. So there you get, again, you have that childlike um, activity of being a follower of Jesus. Um, you, you'll find in Matthew 21, it's after Jesus cleanses the temple. That's where um, the children have been singing Hosanna. Uh, Jesus has risen into Jerusalem. The children are crying out and singing, and, uh, and the disciples or the Pharisees want them to be quiet. And he says if they're quiet, you know, the stones will cry out. And he also talks about, he references a passage in the Old Testament where he says that praise is ordained from the mouths of babes and suckling infants. I think that's the King James. I grew up on the King James. So, you know, uh, it's, it's, this child likeness is 
is is at the heart of prayer, to be like a child. You'll notice that um, there's, uh, in the Lord's Prayer, um, the Lord's Prayer is very childlike. If you think about it, especially if you take off that doxology at the end that most manuscripts don't have, you know, it just ends with, uh, lead us not into temptation, uh, but deliver us from evil. And that's where it stops. But it's just simply, uh, give us today's bread, uh, forgive us of our sins, glorify your name. It's really, you know, it's, it does, it's not real elaborate, this prayer um, that Jesus taught us. And then one of... Um, the favorite words that you find Jesus using uh, with reference to his Father in heaven is what? What's the word he uses in the garden in Gethsemane? Abba. Abba. That's like daddy. In Spanish, papito. <laughs> papito. I, uh, I told you I did uh, construction uh, and I ended up hooking up with, I did a lot of subcontracting. And I ended up working with a guy that did a lot of work for high-end uh, people in downtown Philadelphia. I got into some really nice homes uh, down in Old City. And we were working in the home of a, a Jewish family uh, at one point, and they had a... They, they did something really cool. i got to explain this to you. They bought that, that one house and then bought the other house behind them on the next street and made it one house with a garden in the middle. I mean, she would water her flowers with a hose in the house. It was so cool. Anyway, they had this uh, uh, spiral staircase uh, at, at one point in the house that, you know, that went up. It was made out of metal. And I was there... Uh, working at something, and their, their, their little daughter was playing on the staircase. I was sort of watching this out of the corner of my eye, and sure enough, uh, she fell. She fell about three steps, came down, and hit the floor, which at that part of the house was concrete. It was out in this garden, and she jumped up, and just, she was three years old, just started crying, Abba, 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 ran back through the house. I'll never forget that. It's a childlike cry. And so what I want to do now is think together with you about what are, what are children like? How can we draw lessons for our praying from children? That's what we're going to do, okay? So um, you'll see here in your book that children are not afraid to begin with themselves, with their problems, with their concerns. Some of you uh, in the first part of the first uh, session said something about, you know, one of your problems was you start, you, you know, I start thinking about myself. <laughs> I start thinking about what I need. Uh, good. <laughs> children do that. How many of you have children that, uh, or had children as, as our case would be, who, uh, you know, at the dinner table, their first, their first concern for you, Mom, is that you, you finish up preparing the meal, and you sit down, and you, and you eat. How many, are, how many children have that concern? None. You start, you start with yourself um, in prayer. And we have a tendency, what happens is we have a tendency to think that, uh, as I think, you know, somebody here said, you know, I get kind of, I start with myself, and then I feel like that's not what this is supposed to be. And what can happen is you kind of freeze. You know, you start, you, you, you come to your prayer time, you just begin to be flooded with everything that's going on and your needs and your hurts and how you don't have this and nobody loves me and X, Y, Z. What I'm telling you is, I think Jesus would tell us that's where you start. You start with yourself. 
and where you're at. You're allowed to do that. Why? Tell me. Digame. Why can I start with myself? What's that? It's childlike, and we are the children of the Father. So it's because I have a relationship, and he loves me. He cares about me. We respond at the table when our kids say, Mom, I want more. <laughs> you know, thinking about themselves. So you start, you start with where you are. Parents don't scold little children for being self-centered, right? I mean, eventually you do. But not when they're really little. You know, we just came from St. Louis where my, my daughter uh, gave birth to her first uh, baby. And uh, the baby's pretty demanding. It's amazing how that two, three hour old can hunt for the nipple. It's amazing to me. And so, you know, we don't, they don't, she doesn't smack her baby and say, stop that. Be more disciplined. <laughs> Think about me, you know? We don't do that. If you have if you're teaching a little one to walk, you don't if they fall, you don't spank them for falling. Or you know, I grew up with spanking, so sorry. But you know, you don't discipline your children because they fall or they stumble. I'm talking about child likeness, uh, little children. And so it's okay for us uh, to begin. Um, with ourselves. And then um, under that, uh, children, children starting with themselves, you also, you also go to God where you are um, and as you are. How, how, um, what's that famous, how many of you grew up in churches where they gave an invitation at the end of the at the end of the service to come forward. Okay, what hymn did you normally sing doing that? Just as I am without one plea, but that, oh man, every time our church would go into that mode, I just propped myself up for a good sleep. It would last about 10 minutes. But that's the gospel. That's a great tune, by the way. I just got tired of it. But it's, we come to God just as we are. It's the, we believe the gospel, right? When you first came to Jesus, how many of you remember your first, your first day of faith, first coming to Jesus? Do, are there some that do? I don't. I grew up in a Christian home. I don't remember never not believing in Jesus, if that's, if that's the hymn book. So, but if you remember that day, did you clean yourself up first? No. You came with a clear understanding that you needed help, right? You, your life probably had unwound. You came to yourself. I love that phrase in the prodigal, in the prodigal son parable. He came to himself sitting in the pigsty. How do, you, how do you come to yourself? You don't wake up one morning and just say, I think I'm going to come to myself. There's outside forces that bring that about, right? So the Spirit of God was at work bringing in conviction, and you had a clear sense of your need, and you flew to Jesus. Amen? You do that now in prayer. You come as you are. How, how much as you are? Well, I'll tell you, here's one of my bad prayer stories. I, um, I was a church planting pastor right across the Taconi here in northeast Philadelphia, and uh, I ended up uh, failing morally in ministry. Uh, my, uh, you know, to guard your imagination, uh, it was my tongue. My tongue is my greatest gift. It's also my greatest hurt. And I used my tongue in the wrong way to the wrong people at the wrong time and undermined the confidence of my session in me. And so when an incident happened between me and my secretary, they pounced, and I was out. In one day, my life collapsed. It was a very dark time. And it 
it put me into a uh, it put it t it kicked Esther and I into a really really dark time. I mean, being a public sinner, there's nothing like it. You know, when that, that story about Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky broke, my heart broke for her. I mean, I was mad too, but my heart broke. Being a public sinner is so painful and so hard. And then I went back into doing contracting work. One day, uh, I was working with another contractor in uh, the Mount Airy section of Philadelphia, and we were repla we were renovating a kitchen. And uh, I, uh, a at one point in the construction, we got the microwave installed, which is always a big day for the contractor because now he can bring lunch and warm it up in there, you know. So uh, we got the microwave in, and uh, the next day on the way, I decided to stop at. Uh, uh, I think it might have been 7-Eleven at the time, and I decided to get one of these gargantuan coffees. You know, they used to, 7-Eleven used to sell like this 32-ounce coffee, you know. And I decided I was going to get a big one and then just nurse it kind of all day long. You know, put it back in the microwave and heat it up. So um, I was driving at that time a van and it had a, an engine howling, you know, and this was before the days of cup holders and stuff. And I had this thing sitting on the engine cowl. And uh, when I pulled in to the uh, to park the van, I stopped a little too quick. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw this thing starting to go over. And I went to grab it. And of course, instead of grabbing it, I punched it. Knocked the top off. It hit the dashboard. And coffee went all up over my dash, on the windshield, down in the vent, dripping on my feet. in and reverse and I backed into the spot and I hit the curb and it went the other way and all 32 ounces of coffee was all over the inside of my van I was furious furious I mean certifiably furious and I threw the door open on the van and I jumped out in the middle of the street in Mount Airy, which is a respectable neighborhood, at 7 o'clock in the morning with my fist in the air, and I shouted, leave me alone. That was prayer. <laughs> I've talked with Paul Miller about this. I got the imprimatur. It was prayer. Now, you don't want to stay there. You can come to God with that kind of rage. You come as you are because he knows you. He knows you anyway. And you can bring it all, warts and all. Uh, he didn't answer that prayer, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a great story of pardon and healing and restoration at the hands of the Philadelphia Presbytery, if you can believe that. And my credentials were restored. My marriage was spared. My kids love me. Uh, the elders that I used to want to run over in my van now support us in this ministry. I can sit and drink with those guys. It's an amazing story. I wanted to kill them, literally. I used to lay in bed at night and think about how I could kill them and get away with it. Okay? Now you know who you're dealing with. <laughs> but my point in all of that is that was prayer. And Paul Miller agreed with me. Oh, yes, that was prayer. You were yelling at the right person. <laughs> and, it, you know, it actually took me a couple of years to figure out that my anger was actually against God. It wasn't against the elders. It was against God. But you can come, that's what I mean. When I say come to God as you are, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, you had a slip of the tongue as you drove in here. <laughs> I'm talking about who are you really. You can get it all out. And you can come to your, your heavenly father. And why is, that, why is that so important? Well, it's the gospel. 
the gospel, people, the gospel is true. You are real sinners, and God's forgiveness through Christ Jesus is a real pardon for real sinners like us. And so you can come to him, and you can, you can make your confession uh, to him. Or you can pour out your heart. You can yell at him. Um, it's, it's, we have to learn to be real in prayer. You know, um, one of the cool things, another one of the cool things in this person of Jesus study is you look at how Jesus relates to the disciples when they're saying stupid stuff. Like, who's the greatest in the I think I'm the greatest in the kingdom. Um, <laughs> you ever notice how patient Jesus was, is with them? Do you know what I think is going on there? Jesus can deal with real people. He can't deal with people that put up a mask. He can't do it. There's some, and I, I am a, I hesitate to say Jesus can't do anything. But there's some kind of a dynamic where when facades come down and you are real, like the disciples, and you say stupid stuff, he can deal with that. He can process that. He's, he's act, you see him actually drawn to that. He engages them in their stupidity. He takes time. He teaches. I mean, there's sometimes he rebukes them. But it's amazing to me how many times, you know, they say stuff that's really like, what? Oh, my, I'd fire these guys in a heartbeat. And he is patient with them. You see, there's something about that openness that, that Jesus can respond to. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over this number two about playing, but uh, ch you know, children play. There is a playfulness in prayer uh, that is a delight, that can be a delight. Again, it has to come out of a relationship. You know, there's certain things, there's certain things, I, I have a very sarcastic humor. Well, you know, uh, you can't do sarcasm with everyone. You know, there has to be a relationship. In other words, I can make a remark about your nose because, well, it probably is big, but I know that you, you're, you're going to understand where I'm coming from, and, you know, there's, a, there's a, a relationship there. And I think it's something like that um, with us. We can kind of play around with our Father in prayer, and it brings him a kind of, uh, a kind of uh, delight. I was at the See Jesus prayer meeting the other day. I was praying that God would please raise up uh, younger people to come and work with us at See Jesus. We're mostly all old guys, and I made that remark. We need some young, good-looking guys, Lord, and everybody laughed. You know, not these old, worn-out guys like me. We need some young studs. I said that in prayer, and they were laughing. I think you can do that in prayer with your father. You can you can play in prayer. I won't I won't say any more about that. But your third point, the third point that you have here in your manual, I think it's on page eighteen. Although I, my pages sometimes don't line up. Is that where it's at? Eighteen, number three. You begin by asking. You ask like a child. So let's think about children and asking. What do little children ask for? Everything. They ask for everything. They have, wh why do they do that? Why do children, little children, ask for everything and anything? They're uninhibited and, and they have no sense of Boundaries. I remember when I was working in South Philly, I did my pastoral internship in South Philadelphia, and uh, the pastor that I was working under there had a seven-year-old son that became enamored with medieval armor. He loved the exhibit at the Philadelphia Museum. <laughs> and he, one Christmas, he asked for a double-edged saber. He was, dead, he was seven years old. He wanted a double-edged saber. Well, his dad didn't give him that, but he had no... He, had, he has no comprehension of what's involved with having something like that. 
Um, but that's how you should come. You ask for anything, and you ask for everything. It's you know, it says we get mature, we begin to understand those limits uh, to what God can do. You know, there's certain things you can't do. No. You ask for everything. What does it mean with children, uh, maybe as they move more toward teenage years, what does it mean when you say no? Ask again. That's right. It means nothing. Yeah, or it's the beginning of the discussion. You continually ask. You keep asking. You have a sense the father's saying no. You keep asking. Keep coming back to him uh, for it, uh, ab about it. Um, how often uh, do children ask? Constant. Constant. People, we have to become more like children in our praying. Constantly asking everything for everything and asking for anything. You know, um, as you, as you mature uh, in prayer, you will get a, a clearer sense that, you know, this is something that God would want to do. This is something that he, he, he might not want to do, uh, given what is revealed in his word uh, or whatnot, you know, as you grow. And so, you know, as you walk past a car that has, uh, you know, a wallet laying on the seat, you're not supposed to pray about whether or not you should break the window and take the, the wallet. So that's maturity. You, you don't have to pray about that kind of but um, the Father is patient with us, and you can come to him uh, as you are with everything. You know, I have the, I, I, I mentioned that I have been around Paul Miller's family a long time. His, Paul Miller has a brother-in-law, it's a very close friend of mine. Um, Paul's sister, uh, Roseanne, is married to a guy named Jim Trot. They're in our church in Philly, and Jim's been a very close friend. So we've ha I've gotten to know the family, that's my point. And I know his mom. Uh, his mom is 93 years old, and she's still a missionary in London uh, with Surge, the mission Surge. Um, Paul, uh, Paul tells a really interesting story. This might actually be in A Praying Life, I can't remember, but he tells a really interesting story. And he was sharing this uh, one time with a group of us guys uh, personally about how he had been to a prayer seminar like this and the leader was saying you know that there's certain things you shouldn't you know you shouldn't ask God for you don't you there's some things you just don't you don't bother God with you don't uh, like for example uh, trying to find a parking spot in downtown Philadelphia you don't you don't pray about that kind of stuff okay that's what this prayer seminar guy was saying well, Paul, uh, Paul about that point checked out of the seminar, but he came home, and he's telling his mom this, who lives in, in London. He's telling his mom this, that this guy said, you know, you shouldn't, pray about, you shouldn't pray about trying to find a parking space. And I'll never forget, he said, her reaction was, how else do you find a parking space? Like natural, what uh, what else do you do? Now you have to keep in mind she lives in London, so it's a it's a quite a challenge. But how else do you find a parking space? How else do I find it in my heart to love? How else do I find the strength to get through the day? How else do I find the the how how else do I find my needs met when I'm a government worker? <laughs> How else? We need to develop that attitude of rosemary. Hold your hands out and shrug your shoulders. How, how else, Lord? How else, Father, can I do this? How else can I get along? So we come to him with everything all the time like little children, making a pain in the you-know-what out of ourselves with him. He delights in it, as you delight in your children coming to you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> maybe uh, maybe that came out of my mouth because I'm thinking about my 22-year-old son right now. I would love for him to come and ask me for anything, 
you know, a hundred bucks, Dad. Uh, yeah. But you delight. You, don't you delight when your kids come and ask, ask you, ask you for things? Um, so that's the pattern for us in children. And then fourthly, speak like a child. This is uh, this is for pastors especially. <laughs> uh, and me. Oh man, my kids have suffered through some awful prayers. Um, but you know, we don't. Uh, I, I mentioned a moment ago. I grew up on the King James Bible. You know, the King James is great, but we just don't talk like that anymore. It's a great translation, it really is. But we don't talk like that anymore. And so, don't pray King James prayers. Um, if you're, uh, you know, from the the uh, baby boomer generation, and you know, used to using thee and thou. Uh, I don't know. I don't. We just don't talk like that. And I think there's something even about the language that we use that can convey using that kind of holy, divine-sounding language conveys something about our attitude in prayers. There's it creates too much of a distance. Jesus used the word papito, <laughs> Abba. There was closeness. There was, there was personal engagement. And so, uh, you know, don't use a, a lower voice, men. Uh, just talk in your natural in your natural way. Um, when you look at the Lord's Prayer, again, it's very normal language. It's not flowery. It's not big words. Give us this day's bread. Give us today our bread. Okay? When you, um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take the time to go through this, but you guys can read through Ephesians, and you know about a third of Ephesians is Paul praying. It's a great lesson in prayer. And Paul's a nut job, man. He's all over the place. He's all over the place in Ephesians. He's praying, and then all of a sudden he stops. He goes off on some theological thing. Then he comes back, and he prays a little bit more, and then he goes off on two or three other rabbit trails, and finally in chapter 3 he ends his prayer. He, it's, it, is, it is prayer lessons for people with ADD. Ephesians. The book of Ephesians. He, he's, he is very spontaneous in his praying, and he switches in and out of it very naturally. My wife is growing in that. It, you know, I'm, it irritates me sometimes. But we're talking about something, and I, I can't tell, is she talking to me now or is she talking to Jesus? Uh, <laughs> uh, so, but... I, I commend her for that. I think there's something very godly about spontaneously moving into tra uh, into <laughs> into traffic. Into uh, I got my uh, trip home on my mind. You know, there's something very spontaneous about moving in and out of of uh, prayer uh, with the Lord at any at any moment. And so, I wanna what I wanna do right now is. Um, for the next few minutes, I want us to practice this. And so this time I'll give you some instructions. I, I, I want us to take about five minutes and just, um, just quiet ourselves and pray like a little baby or a little kid from your heart. And, and do that in silence if you can. Um, and then we're going to come back and talk about it. Okay? Let's pray.
pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay. What was that like for you? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. She, she, yeah, okay, great. She did ADD praying. What was that like? Yes, ma'am, in the back there. Wow, wow. She wanted to keep going. She wanted to keep praying. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, good. Good for you, yes. Hmm. What did that feel like? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. I don't even want people safe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The half has never been told. Uh, yeah, the key word, the key word that she just used was liberating. That is the number one response I get in Latin America, where they live under, the word in Spanish is deber, I ought. I ought to pray more. I ought to give more. I ought to do more. I ought to stay home and be faithful to my wife. You know, some of the things that ought to be done. But they live in Latin America. I think it has to do with their whole history, not just the Roman Catholic Church. And please forgive me if you're a, a Roman Catholic brother or sister here, but there comes, I think, sometimes with Roman Catholicism just this heavy duty. You've got things you've got to perform, things you've got to do. And and they live under that. It has more to do, it has to do with their whole history um, in, in Latin America, performance, a performance uh, mentality. That's the number one word I hear in Latin America. That was liberating. I've never experienced anything like that in church. Anybody else? Yes? It was fun. Good. Did you tell any jokes? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. Very good. This, um, Becoming childlike in your praying, if you can become childlike in your praying and really pursue that and practice that, you're going to see a new kind of flow in your praying, a new kind of sort of uh, fluid dynamic in your praying. And, uh, you know, I hope that you are going to experience the, the freedom in that. I want to move into the next lesson. It's a very short lesson, and I and I think I'm just going to uh, touch on it briefly. I also wanted to commend for your reading at the end of each of these sections. There's a a little bit of a word from a guy named David Pallison. David Pallison is a very close friend uh, of Paul Miller's, and by the way, David is at this moment uh, dying of pancreatic cancer. Uh, so you can pray for Paul, too. He's a very close friend. And, you know, Paul and his wife just lost a daughter about six weeks ago. 
and a nephew about uh, 12 weeks ago that died. Angelo, Angelo Giuliani's uh, son had a son that died. Um, so they're experiencing, oh, and Jill's mother died last week. So they're experiencing a lot of death uh, and dying right now. Um, but David Powlison's reflections at the end, David is the director of uh, Christian Counseling and Education Foundation that's affiliated with Westminster Seminary. Uh, and um, he's, he's, uh, he helped Paul write this stuff. So his reflections are really good. I want to look at, I want to look briefly at, at lesson three. I might actually try to get you out of here a little bit early. Um, a couple other things to notice uh, about children, or one big item uh, in this one is that you begin early with your father, as it says at the, the title. Now, um, <laughs> I know that some of us are night owls and some of us are morning birds. Um, but it does seem that throughout the scriptures you see these patterns of, uh, of rising early. You know, if you have friends that have little kids uh, and you need to call them at like 7 o'clock in the morning, is that okay? Yeah, why? The kids are already up and they're already up. My grandkids and one of my fa my kids' families, uh, one of the grandkids, are not allowed out of the bedroom before seven o'clock. So they got a big clock and they taught their kids how to tell time from infancy, and <laughs> they can read, they can play with toys in their room. They may not come out of the room until seven o'clock. <laughs> They're up at five thirty, you know. I've been at baseball diamonds at 6.30 in the morning with my grandson pitching baseball. Uh, there is something about uh, getting up early, and I, I have to tell you, this is, a, this is easy for me. Uh, I think it has to do with my age. Uh, I don't need very much sleep anymore, and I wake up uh, at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. I typically don't get out of bed until 5.30 or four to six, but there's something about that morning hour that I I have come to love with my father. There's no distractions. It's quiet, um, and I get let you know I can move more quickly into his presence uh, at that hour. So there's some there's some kind of a dynamic in that that I you know that I can't I can't really put my finger on it, but you kind of see this pattern. Um, all throughout scripture and there's there's something God, there's like a mysterious dynamic about it that your heart seems a little bit more open uh, to hear from God and to, and to speak to him in the morning now maybe some of you are sitting there and thinking uh, I, I don't really think in the morning you know I can't really move in the morning yeah uh-huh Yeah, that's like me too. If you're a task-oriented person like she and I, uh, you know, you, if, once you get started into something, it's over, baby. Uh, prayer's done. Uh, I can't, I can't get my my mind back. That's how it, that's how it works for me. But you know, there's um, there's uh, something too uh, along with. Um, rising early. Well, let me mention this first. You'll see there's a number of biblical passages. I think you have these, uh, especially in the Psalms. There's a whole list of Psalms there, and every one of those verses talks about the morning, meeting the Lord in the morning. You see them about night, too, actually, in the Psalms. You'll see that he cries out on his bed at night um, and so forth. But there's a lot of Psalms about getting up in the morning and and uh, making my cry. And then you have Jesus, who is the impersonation of the Psalms, gets up early. You know, there's a couple of passages where it talks about him getting up before it was light. When it was still dark, he, he got up. 
and he got alone with his um, with his father. So a couple of you know a couple of practical things about working at this, and especially if you know uh, Esther is actually a night person. So I understand, you know I um, I'll I'll say uh, you know we have a great marriage between like twelve and four. <laughs> She's waking up around 12, and I'm starting to nod off around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so I understand the night the night dynamic. Esther's mind is most active in the night. She reads at night and does things. And a lot of it's because I've finally shut up and you know, gone to sleep. Um, but there's a couple of practical things about this. And one is, if, if you want to if you wanna take this to heart and, and follow the pattern of Jesus in this and getting up early, Begin with baby steps. In other words, don't get up at 4.30 <laughs> and try to pray for three hours. Uh, don't do that. Try to, get up, try to get up 15 minutes earlier and spend some time uh, before. You know, take little steps like babies do, like children do, learn from children. Take little steps in trying to build really any prayer discipline into your life. Take little baby steps. Don't, you know, don't be like Martin Luther. I've got so much to do, I can't pray less than four hours a day. I tried that. Um, you know, I had, uh, when I was going to college, I was ma we were married when I was going through college. I, we did a lot of things wrong. And um, we had kids, too. And I uh, was determined that I was going to have a rich prayer life. And so, you know, I started getting up. I started getting up at, uh, you know, 6.30 in the morning, and uh, my oldest daughter got up at 6.30. And uh, so I thought, well, I'm going to, I'll try getting up at 5.30, uh, and Sarah got up at 5.30. And I tried getting up at 4.30, and she got up at 4.30. And, you know, that killed my prayer life for years. <laughs> I couldn't get up and have peace and quiet because she kept getting up. And I know, you know, some of you have kids, you have little kids, and that's going to be something you have to you have to work at and take into consideration. But try beginning with little, uh, little things. Another thing that is really important in this, and I, I think this is sort of, um, it's not really in your in your notes, but under under the uh, the baby steps. Um, another thing that is really, uh, I think, is really important in growing in, in this discipline in prayer is to have a place where you pray. You know, Jesus talks about the closet, you know, going in and shutting the closet door. I think there's something about, I have a, a in the winter, I have one chair, and in the summer, I have another one. I sit out in our front porch, and I watch the sun come up. And I get my coffee, and I sit out there. Uh, and our street's really quiet uh, early in the morning. And that place, it seems like my mind moves more easily into prayer. When I get in a place, I have a little table that I put out there for my coffee cup and, uh, you know, a, uh, a, a yard chair out there that's comfortable, and I sit out there. In the wintertime, I sit down in our basement by a fireplace. We have a fireplace, and I start a fire and I sit down in the basement with my coffee and pray. Those spaces are really important. When we have guests over in the wintertime and I can't sit down by the fireplace, my, my prayer life goes out the window. So having a place that is quiet and a place that you, you, you know, sort of fits you is really good, is really important. That's a very practical um, you know, a very practical thing that I have found through the years that's worked. Another thing that helps is um, to do this is to pray out loud. And if you can, if you can, I do a lot better praying when I when I pray out loud. I actually in the morning I kind of mumble, um, but praying out loud. And you again, you'll see that in the scriptures. There's all kinds of references to crying out. Um, uh, to shouting, 
you get the impression that the psalmist is actually vocalizing in prayer. And that can really be an effective tool uh, for helping you to grow um, in your prayer life. Another thing that I do, and this isn't in the book, I walk when I pray. I, I've done that a little bit. I'm trying to contain myself here tonight. But I, I walk the house. I, I don't know why. I th- can think better. You know, after I've sat in my chair for a, an hour, I, I just have to get up and I have to move and talk out loud. That, that can be, that's a suggestion. Um, but I find that uh, very effective. Um, so you have to learn, you have to learn, study yourself and learn patterns that will make it easier for you to move into prayer and do those things. Um, uh, really uh, good, good stuff. Um, I think I'm, I think I'm going to stop there. Is it all right to stop a half an hour early? I know you have worked, many of you, and uh, so I don't want to exasperate my children. Um, tomorrow, you know, we are not going to get through this whole manual, and quite frankly, the last, from like uh, lesson seven on, it's primarily about the use, it's, it's, there's teaching and so forth, but it's primarily about the use of prayer cards. And it has to do with entering into the story. You know, I talked about that, entering into the, God's, the story that God is writing. Well, uh, we're going to look a little bit at the use of prayer cards tomorrow and, and how that works. But um, before that, we're going to, uh, lesson uh, four is, is one of my favorite uh, about helplessness and how helplessness is the, a, a good basis out of which to pray, that sense of helplessness. I, I can't do this. Uh, I need Jesus. And then we're going to talk about um, the asking in Lesson 5, asking your Father for anything. It's a little bit more of, a, of an expansion on um, what I just said about children asking for everything. So we're going to look at that uh, tomorrow as well. Okay? Let's pray. Father, uh, we're so thankful uh, for the opportunity that you've given us here. And we thank you that you are at work by your Spirit. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that the Spirit has been given according to your promise. And we have your Spirit. And Jesus teaches us in Luke 11, we have your Spirit for the asking. We don't have to crank it up. We don't have to crank up our emotions. We don't have to flash ourselves. We ask for the Spirit, and the Spirit will be given. So teach us, Lord, what it is in this that this life of faith is a life of asking for the Holy Spirit, and grow us in that. And even tomorrow, as we look again uh, more closely at the themes of uh, helplessness and then praying about everything, guide us. Give us good rest uh, this evening. Uh, get us up tomorrow. Bring us here with joy. Give you thanks through Christ. Amen. Oh, thank you.